This is Studies in Nehemiah, part 11. Continuing from last Sunday night on how to keep the joy of your calling. How to keep the joy of your calling. It's a, about a 14-verse text, but it, some sermons you can preach without reading the whole text at the beginning. But when it's a narrative, a story, an account like this, you really need to get the text into your mind first before starting to analyze it. So I'm going to read. Nehemiah chapter 6, the first 14 verses. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of the enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together at Hekephorim in the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sam Ballot for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, quote, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel, and this is why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, quote, there is a king in Judah. And now the king is going to hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. And I sent to him saying, no such thing as you say, have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will droop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now, when I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his house, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood, and I saw that God had not sent them, and he had pronounced prophecy against me because of Tobiah and Sanbel had hired him. Interesting about this prophetic thing and the way Nehemiah, there's this prophecy and, and quickly Nehemiah just says, that's not God. <laughs> like in a church, if you ever did that today, boy, they would roast you as being at quenching the spirit or not Pentecostal or there'd be all sorts of things that would happen. Here's this prophet and he speaks. Nehemiah goes, ah, that's not God. I love it. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. And he prays, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did. And also the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. It's a fascinating account. We're coming to the end of the part of Nehemiah we're going to be studying in detail, maybe one or two more after this. We started looking at, I called them three tactics of the enemy to pull Nehemiah from the completion of the wall. Of course, I'm not talking to you about walls. You're not building walls around a city somewhere. We're talking, we're using this about building your life, rebuilding, brokenness, rubble, parts that need strengthening. That's what we're looking at when we use this as a base. We're talking about the building, the reconstructing that we do in our lives as we follow the Lord. Nehemiah has a couple of things going for him. He's called. He knows he's called. You have to look back at the previous studies to see all the provisions that God worked out for him. So he has this sense of mission. He has a sense of importance, not self-importance, but importance in the job. Those walls have to be completed for security, protection, and a host of other things. 
He has this sense of assignment. And what we started to just unpack a little bit last week, whenever, whenever God calls, Satan obstructs. Whenever God calls, Satan obstructs. That's what you're seeing here. And I said last week there are three primary examples, tools that get used in this case that we can apply to our lives. Distraction, slander, and fear. And I think those three things get repeated over and over again when anyone with any sense of calling in your Bible study group, in your Christian ed class, in your parenting in your home, in your witness for Christ, in in your involvement in the church, and whatever it might be, you have a calling on your life. I hope. You're not just drifting, oh, I'm going to church one week, and then I go another week, and we'll just keep doing that until Jesus comes. No, a calling. I'm, I'm doing something for God. I know why I'm here. I know what he has for me to do, and I'm working on that. Whenever that manifests itself in any life, in any ministry, Satan obstructs. That's what he does. And those same three tactics, they just get used over and over and over. If you lead in anything, you're going to experience distraction, slander, and fear. You'll have to chew those things up and swallow them over and over again because they will never go away until Jesus comes back. The distraction, these leaders urge Nehemiah to come down from the wall for meetings. Dialogue, that's a great word today. There's just nothing more important than dialogue. We have to have dialogue. Nehemiah, come, let's dialogue about this. Our text says they came to Nehemiah four times. We have to dialogue. Stop the work. Let's have a chat. They weren't really interested in making peace with Nehemiah. They didn't care a lot about Nehemiah. They wanted him to stop work on the wall. They wanted him to abandon his calling. My father-in-law, every once in a while, he goes to a little church in Morden, Manitoba. He's 90, I'll get this wrong, 92, coming up to, right, Rini? Coming up to 92. And every once in a while, I would talk to him when we would visit. And it's, it's not a huge church. And somebody would be mad about something, and they left the church. And I would always say to him, what happened to brother so-and-so and so-and-so? And he'd go, oh, they got flies in their nose. That was his solution to it. Oh, they just had flies in their nose. That's what they want to do to Nehemiah. Just get them all, you know, freaked out. He knew the hearts of his critics. He saw through their plan, his wisdom there. Verse 3 is marvelous. And I sent messengers to them. Four times. I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? That is, that is Nehemiah's, here's two words, repeated and renewed sense of assignment. That's what you need in your life. A repeated and a renewed sense of calling and assignment on what you do for the Lord. He's, he's driven by this sense of mission. And the lesson is this. Never leave something important to engage in something fruitless. Does that make sense? Never leave something important to engage in something fruitless. Nehemiah wasn't being loveless. That's not it. He was being discerning. And if you're going to lead, you'll always have to shun distractions. You have to live in the glow of your calling. The second tactic. We looked at that last week. That was just a quick review. Maybe you'll, you'll judge how quick it was. The second thing, slander. Look at five through nine. In the same way, that means this is just repeated, ongoing. 
In the same way, Sam Ballot, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter. We'll talk about that in a minute. An open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, so there you go, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. And that's why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you also have set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. Now the king's going to hear these reports. So, so now come and let us take counsel together. And then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say have been done. For you are inventing them out of your own mind. You're inventing them. You can see the maliciousness here. You're, you're, you, you lie awake at nights trying to think of things that will just mess things up. That's what the enemy does. That's what the enemy does. Schemes, Paul calls them in Ephesians. It's what Satan does. He plans things against people with a calling. You're inventing them out of your own mind. Well, they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will droop from the work and it will not be done. Quick prayer. Now, oh God, strengthen my hands. Notice Notice from verse 5 that all of these words, they come from what's called an open letter. The NIV, I think, translates it an unsealed letter. If anybody has an NIV, I think that's what it says, an unsealed letter. You've seen movies, you've seen a, a, a king, somebody important sends a document, it goes in an envelope of some kind, and there's a wax seal and then a stamp. Closest thing they had in those days to a registered letter where you would sign to receive. So, so it's sealed. If I get that and the king's seal is broken, I know somebody's tampered with that since it was sent to me. That's the whole idea. It's security. So there's this unsealed letter. The soft seal on the outside, it's been broken. An open letter means two things. It was what we would call an unsigned letter, so the author maintains anonymity. And then, it, and then the letter was also a proclamation. It was read publicly. Its contents were designed to be distributed to the masses. And you notice that the source is never directly quoted in the letter. Look at these things. Verse 6, it's reported among the nations. 6b, according to these reports, who, who, who's reporting? Who's saying this? Well, we don't know. According to whose reports? Doesn't say. There's, there's nothing here anyone could really put a finger on. There was no one to respond to. It's always the road to gossip, and rumor. It's designed for distribution, <laughs> but it's never signed. Stuff just gets said. Stuff just spreads. Perhaps Nehemiah could track down some of the sources, but how much time is that going to take? And what happens to the walls? Well, this is exactly what is desired. Get them all tied up. That's what the enemy wants. While he's embroiled in witch hunting, the walls won't be going up. And so Nehemiah, he's wise enough to keep his attention on the big picture. He's, he's more concerned. Here it is. He's more concerned about the walls than he is his own reputation. He doesn't have to defend himself. But the walls have to keep going up. That's his assignment. That's his calling. That's why he's there. It's a pretty important life lesson. You can bank on it. God can't do anything great with a person committed to defending his or her own rights. It just won't work. If I'm committed to protecting my own rights, 
I will never accomplish anything in the kingdom of God. Look at Romans 12, 17 to 21. And Paul writes to Christians, all right? He writes to people like we. And he says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It won't always be possible, but as much as is possible, as much as it depends on you, he says. Live peaceably with all. How are we going to do that? Well, here's a start. 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. There's the starting place to peace. You're part of it, at least. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Well, then what about me? Well, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You overcome evil with good by not taking personal vengeance. In another place, Jesus talked about people who persecuted you, and he said, here's something else you can do. In addition to feeding and clothing, you can bless them. You pray for them. Why is this Paul's emphasis in a chapter dealing with using gifts of the Spirit? That's what Romans 12 is about, using the gifts of the Spirit in the body of Christ. Because that's how the enemy messes up spiritual gifts. He gets people defending themselves, justifying themselves, avenging themselves. Perhaps that's the key here. Nehemiah is not a selfish leader. He has bigger things to consider than his own reputation. Think how easy. Like, he knows, the text says, Nehemiah knows all these things are lies, right? He says so. None of this is true. How easy it would have been and how much spiritual muscle it took for him not to do it. How easy it would have been for Nehemiah to say, this isn't right what they're doing. That'd just be every, every bone in your body would want to say that. Or you might even put a more spiritual thrust to it. You know what? If I don't deal with these people and their slander, they're going to do it to somebody else. So for the good of the body of Christ, I think I better straighten this out right now just to protect other people. Doesn't that sound righteous? It's devilish. So that's Nehemiah and the slander. If you're leading anything at all, you will have opposition. And know this for sure, there are times, there are times when those who oppose you, Christian enemies are just like pagan enemies. They get a lot like that. Determined to do what Nehemiah did. Take the matter to God. Verse 9, they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will droop from the work. It will not get done. Oh, God, strengthen my hands. That's a lot better than a, than a three-week argument with some people who are lying about you. Oh, God, strengthen my hands. Don't get embroiled. Don't quit on your calling. Stay close to God in prayer. Leave your rights with God. Well, Pastor Don, I don't know what world you're living in. I, act, I never signed up for that. And I'd like to say to you, you did, in fact. You might not be aware of it. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, let me tell you what you signed up for, okay? Here's what you agreed to. 1 Peter 2, 21. For to this you have been called. Who's he talking about? Because Christ also suffered for you. Did Jesus die for you? He's talking to you then, right? He's saying, put your name here. I, I'm careful who I name. Jonathan, Jonathan Kramer, 
uh, here's your calling. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. He did nothing wrong at all. And yet he was reviled. <laughs> did you know they spit on Jesus? You ever had anybody do that to you? Spit on you. On Jesus. What did he do? Call a bunch of angels and just trash them all. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered unjustly, mind you, he didn't threaten. Here's what Jesus did do. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's what Jesus did. Paul says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Leave it to me. Where did Paul get that kind of theology? Well, he got it from the way they saw Jesus. When Jesus was unjustly treated, more violated than anyone could be violated, when you consider the spotless Lamb of God, he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So notice those words, to this you've been called. This is what you signed up for. This is what a salvation lifestyle looks like. It isn't optional. When you come to the cross, you give up the right to defend yourself. That's one of the things that gets crucified. When you take up that cross daily, take up the cross daily. What's, what's on that cross every day? My right to defend myself. Fear, the third thing. 10 to 14. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God. That sounds holy. Within the temple. Let's close the doors of the temple. For they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you by night. Tonight. You're a dead man, Nehemiah. We got it. We got to go. Let's hide. This is this is what the prophet said to him, the man of God. Eleven. But I said, second time he's used these words. Should such a man as I run away? Is this is this right? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? Important sentence. We'll look at it. I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him. This guy comes with this prophecy. But he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose, he was hired that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did. This is Jesus continuing to him who judges righteously. This is Paul. I will avenge. You don't have to. And this is and this is Nehemiah. Oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. It's, it's a fascinating thing. Question. How did Nehemiah know that this message of the prophets was not of the Lord? Did God just give him some discernment, some special word of knowledge or something. So did an angel come and tell Nehemiah, don't listen to these people. They're not, they're not prophets. They're not telling you the truth. And I guess both those things could have happened, but I don't think either of them did. He knew they weren't prophets by two means that are available to everybody sitting here tonight. He knew, first of all, that it was wrong for him or anyone not of the priesthood to enter the doors of the temple. 
They were trying to lead him to sin and ruin his reputation. In other words, here's what they were going to do. These prophets, they're, they're coming to kill you tonight, Nehemiah. But God will protect you. Come into the house of the Lord with us and close the doors. Well, the prophet, there weren't anybody. No one was coming to kill Nehemiah that night. Here's what they would do. In the morning, they'd come out of the temple, and all these people would go, and they'd say, Nehemiah wasn't supposed to be in the temple. He's not a priest. Do you see what kind of leader you have? Look at what they're doing. Like it's a lose-lose. That's what they're trying to do. So how did Nehemiah know they weren't prophets? Because Nehemiah knew his Bible. <laughs> Nehemiah knew the commandments of the Lord, that only priests go into the temple. He didn't have to know anything else to know that these prophets were full of baloney. It's in the Hebrew. I think he says, you guys are full of baloney. Nehemiah knew this because he had read, pondered, prayed about, and studied the laws of God. Because his life was grounded in the word of God that he had, he was spared incredible ruin, saw through the plan of the enemies. And the psalmist writes about this very thing, this protection that comes from knowing God's word, over and over again, I just give a few examples. Are they in your notes, those examples from the Psalms? Okay. Psalm 119, 92, 93. If your law had not been my delight, look, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Oh, if there's... If there's you know, there are certain principles that are so big and so important. They're like the foundation under your house, only the house is your walk with God now. Right at the bottom, the foundation of it all, here's the principle. Anything God commands or anything God forbids is for your freedom and joy in the long run, even if you don't see it at the moment. Do you know how many people desert God, give up on religion, blame the church, walk away because they... God was requiring something of them, and they didn't want to listen. And so all they saw was restriction. All they saw was duty. All they saw was something hemming them in from expressing the desires of their hearts. So they saw all of the commands of God as taking something away. The psalmist says, by those same commands, you've given me life. Remember it all your life. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have those who love your law. Look, this is like Nehemiah. Nothing can make them stumble. It's perfect. Protection in your whole life. The protection for your life is in this book. How much time do you give it every day? This protects your life. This protects your life. That's what the psalmist is saying. Psalm 119, 174, 175. I long for your salvation, O Lord. Your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you and let your rules help me. I hope you catch the power of those things. Okay, I got to move on. So the two things Nehemiah knew, so he knew they were false prophets. He knew that it was wrong for him to go into the temple. Secondly, he knew that God had called them, him to build the wall, and he knew that this activity would hinder his work. See verse 11? Should such a man as I flee? Now, maybe those words need just a teeny bit of explanation. They're not some proud, arrogant boast. Look at me, someone like me. He doesn't, he doesn't mean that. Here's what Nehemiah is saying. I'm not doing this. One, it's wrong, and I know the commands. There's the base for everything. But secondly, to such a man as I flee, this is not why I'm here. I know why I'm here. This is not my calling to leave this. What does all this intrigue, this espionage, have to do with building the walls? This isn't for me. I know who has called me. I know why I'm here. Do you remember at the beginning of this book, he waits five months praying on God. He knows his calling. He 
Keep your life focused on what God has for you to do. Never lose sight of the day of judgment and reward. That's what verse 14 is all about, though it's just kind of hinted at rather than flat out stated. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat. Remember. Why does God have to remember? Well, there's going to be a reckoning. Remember this. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did and the prophetess. God will keep track of all the injustices in your life. Church, God will keep track of all the injustices in your life. It's not my job to look after the injustices. More good ministries are ruined, not by what people said about some leader, but by the way some leader responded to what people said. That's how God distracts and pulls people away. I was thinking, and man alive, at 41 years, I've been treated way better than any pastor deserves to be treated. But I was thinking about just some of the things that I've had said to me in the 41 years. And you have to, you know, it's great to preach stuff, and then it's also good if you can live by it, too. I can remember a lady sat, we hadn't been in this church a year, a lady sat in my office and told me that God showed her that I was the Antichrist. <laughs> that sucks the life out of your day, you know? I've been told I was one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. That's not bad. I've been told I was a an instrument of Satan. I told that. I mean, far more nice things have been said. But you know, you, you, you just... Remember when I was 21, starting out in the ministry, I can remember my dad saying to me, you know, you're not always going to be right, and you don't have to pretend you are, but you have to have some convictions that are just your own convictions and a calling, and you have to just live by it. And you let the pieces fall where they may, but you, you follow the Lord as best you can. Let me encourage you. Because this isn't just this isn't just for pastors. Your sense of calling where you are, and that's another thing. I'm not just asking you whether you're a Christian or not. A lot of Christians live years and never stop and say, What's my calling? What's my calling? 1000 Gorham Street or wherever you live or your place of work. What is my calling? What is it God has put me here for? And then just stick to it. Do it in his name. Do it for his glory. Get yourself out of the way. And watch the walls go up and you rebuild. Everyone said, 